Hi, this is Tracy Takahama Espinosa, and today we're going to look at the concept of emotional intelligence and where it comes from. What is the real definition of emotional intelligence? What are some of the models and what tests of emotional intelligence exist? And then make sure that we understand that emotional intelligence is not the same as multiple intelligence, and emotional intelligence is not necessarily social cognition, so we can clarify those terms at the end, and then hopefully leave a space for our questions. Emotions, okay, so remember we talked about emotions being something that impulses you to take action, right? So we understand that we can interpret this in physiological, um, psychological, and behavioral levels. The word intelligence, so emotional intelligence, so if emotion means to move or impulse somebody towards action, there's a lot of different definitions that we have out here. The, the real hardcore one that comes from Latin basically means the one who knows how to choose, which is very interesting if you look back at what we talked about before. Uh, in that there is no decision without emotions. So we see now there's a really clear connection here between general intelligence and emotions. Other definitions are, are related to the ability to understand um, or the ability to resolve problems. And we know that it's very heavily reliant on sense perception as well as memory. So we also see that, that intelligence is a general mental capacity that implies being able to reason, plan, resolve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, and learn. Learn really quickly or learn from habituated experience. So there's a lot of ways to approach this definition. And we know that there's things like street smarts versus being innately intelligent in something or being gifted, right? So we have this big spectrum of ideas to consider when we look at a definition of intelligence. All of these, by the way, come from the American Psychological Association and their definitions of uh, intelligence. We also know that intelligence differs greatly based on an individual's past experience, right? And so how they are able to react and adapt to their environment and to the things that actually happen to them in their daily lives. So each new learning helps you build upon uh, future learning, which is why the more you know, the more you can know, right? And we also look at intelligence as being a way of organizing, organizing and understanding your world, the way you can actually categorize it and structure the world around you. So verbs that we have related to the word intelligence have to do with being adaptable or being able to learn or to comprehend, create, identify, understand, memorize, think, perceive, plan, reason, reflect, resolve, know, or overcome obstacles. And the words that are associated typically with emotions, you might run up your own list, but some words that come to mind are feeling, perceiving, uh, disquiet, reaction, pleasure, alarms. Different people will use the word emotions in, in different types of ways. So if we have all of this huge package of, of ideas connected with emotions and connected with intelligence, what are some of these or emotional theories? You know, Jung placed these things on, on this kind of a spectrum, which is kind of interesting to know that love is the opposite of hate, right? Uh, aggression is very different from wonder. I challenged you to think about exactly how you would lay out. If you had, uh, if you could list all the emotions that come to your mind right now, then what kind of a spectrum, what kind of a visual could you offer us for those? I mean, are those things that are necessarily, are they a linear concept? Are they circular like this? Are they like Takanishi's um, cube? There's a lot of different ways to consider the structure of emotions. When we consider emotional intelligence, however, there's really just four parameters that we're looking at. And one has to do with the self, an individual, me, myself, and then being able to understand what do I feel? And then being able to manage what I do. And then the second scale has to do with understanding the other, being able to perceive emotions in other people. I can see he's sad. I can see she's worried. Okay. And then how do I manage that? Okay. So they have to do with the scale of first being able to interpret and understand, and then being able to do something about it, to manage it. And from the scale of the individual that's at hand, one is myself and then the others. So this is the basic concept of emotional intelligence. In Goldman's model, he has out six different building blocks for this. And he says that to really consider yourself emotionally intelligent, you have to have an elevated level of self-awareness right, to be able to understand what is it that you're feeling. Self-regulation means how to manage yourself. And then the social skills to interpret others' feelings as well as empathy to feel what they might be feeling. Then you also have to have motivation to be able to react in an appropriate way to those individuals. And then that leads to your ability then to come to a superior decision-making level. And if you recall, we spend a lot of time talking about the connection between emotions and decision making. So the idea is if you can have all of these building blocks in place, then you're able to make better decisions in your life. 
There's a um, keep it simple, stupid model. There's a kiss model, <laughs> which is basically what we said before. There's myself, and then there's the others, and then there's being able to uh, understand or recognize that emotion and being able to manage it. So there's a lot of different ways, a lot of different pictures. Some people break them down into more elements than others, all of the sub-elements. So you can actually look at, for example, to regulate your emotion. You have to be able to do this in yourself and in others. But this means through nonverbal perception of how somebody is reacting. Remember we talked last week about how people interpret really quickly facial expressions, even though they're not conscious that they're interpreting that. But then you also have to understand how to feel empathy towards that other person and what they might be experiencing and why. So what are some of the models of emotional intelligence that exist out there? We have, uh, again, this whole thing of myself and the other, being self-aware, self-management, and then the other, empathy and actually managing other, other people's emotions. So there's several different models that exist out there. One of the most important in my mind, mainly because it's been around for a long time and uh, well substantiated and continually developed over the years, is Olivier and Meyer's model, which proposes that emotional intelligence is the ability to monitor one's own and others' feelings and to discriminate among them and to use that information then to take proper action, right? To be able to behave or to react in the correct way. So they break this down in a slightly different way from Goldman. They say that you have to perceive emotions, which is similar to Goldman, but then you have to use those emotions. You have to be able to harness that in order to get something else. So it's not only being able to interpret and react appropriately to, to emotions, but it's being able to use emotional states of others, which is kind of, um, sounds a teeny bit manipulative, but the idea is actually in, in the positive. It's being able to, it's not only saying, oh, when he's vulnerable, I'm going to take advantage of him. No, it's basically saying that, you know, this is knowing to, when you're asking dad for $10, you know, to go out, you know, when is he in the right mood to do that, right? So there's this actual use of emotional states of others. And then there's understanding of of the other person's emotions, which is similar to Goldman's model, and to manage them as well. So in this sense, you have this self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills that are necessary. They're defined in these ways, and then you can actually see what this means. So a person who has an element of emotional intelligence, which is being self-aware, you can actually see that this person shows self-confidence. They're realistic in their self-assessments. They don't think they're better or worse than what they really are. And they have a self-depreciating sense of humor. They can actually make fun of themselves because, you know, they got nothing to lose. Because they're just so cool in their skin, as we say in California, right? They're just so self-aware that they don't have any problems with joking about who they are because they know who they are. In terms of self-regulation, these are people who really show a high level of trustworthiness, integrity. They don't mind having things that are ambiguous, so they don't, don't worry that they don't know everything, right? And they're open to these ideas of, of change. So self-regulation means that you're able to go with the flow, right? You can manage these things in different ways. Motivation is another hallmark of emotional intelligence. It's not that you just receive this information, but you know then how to move this to action. So these are people who have a strong desire to achieve. They're very optimistic about their ability to face difficulties, and they are committed to these types of changes. So these are great hallmarks of emotional intelligence, as is empathy, your ability to sense what others are feeling. And finally, having social skills and the, the ability to react is also a huge part of emotional intelligence. Not only reacting or, or feeling what the other feels, being empathetic towards that person, but also you know, using that information to lead to positive change. This is what a lot of people who work in psychology do when they guide their patients. It's also a part of being persuasive, you know, change, instigating the, the correct change based on the emotional states of others. Um, and this has a lot to do with the way people uh, lead others or lead other groups. So with this kind of background information, which a lot of the different models share, we can look at some of those specific models that actually exist out there. And so um, this one comes from the multi-health systems interpretation of models of emotional intelligence. They have to do with outcomes. So emotional and social functioning, being able to perform well, um, social engagement levels are what happens when things work well, right? So then you have well-being of the individual. And so if you're able to manage stress, if you have good self-perception, if you're able to express yourself well, good to personal relationships, then all of these things link in the emotional sense to being able to making good decisions. And what are some of the skill sets that are necessary? You have problem solving, flexibility, self-regard, emotional expression, assertiveness, empathy. Uh, at the core of this is basically emotional intelligence. And so this is one model. 
Goldman's model, as we mentioned before, had those uh, six different elements. Then you have some other very simple uh, models that look at just empathy, assertiveness, impulse control, and optimism. This is like the, a really simplistic view of emotional intelligence. Others have to do with different competencies levels, which they break down even further. And these have to do with some corporate models of emotional intelligence, basically with a different kind of a goal in mind, right? That we're actually trying to satisfy a customer. We're trying to sell more things. It's a different view of how you can leverage some of the information in emotional intelligence. One of the ones I like a lot, this one I like just mainly, it's heavily detailed. And so some people like to shy away from this because they don't like uh, too much information here but it's the same thing we talked about before right this is the me this is the other this is can I be aware of myself and then uh, what does that mean and then how can I do this with other people right so if you can get your head around these things I think there's a lot of examples in this particular model which are kind of helpful once we began to accept that emotional intelligence was real even though it was not as tangible and easy to measure as some other things uh, that were coming out as far as traditional intelligence tests there were some great attempts to actually come up with tools now how do we know if somebody is highly emotionally intelligent because we know that this has great spin-off effects for society if we have more people who are emotionally intelligent we have less conflicts we have more people who can get along well and so it's positive right we want people who are emotionally intelligent but how do we know if we've got them so how do we measure this so some of the models that came out one of the ones I mentioned before had to do with Meyer and Salovey's work. They posed a lot of really interesting questions themselves when they were trying to come up with tools. They said, is it possible to be wrong when you answer an emotional intelligence test? Or is what you're trying to get out is basically a, on a scale of things, where are people falling so that you can figure out where strengths are and where weaknesses are, not saying they are or are not emotionally intelligent. So what they came up with is a multi-factor emotional intelligence scale that had 12 different tasks involved in them. And these tasks had to do with uh, meta-processing, abstraction, abstract understanding, knowledge-based processing, input processing, among other things. So if you're interested in looking at their test, you can um, find that online. It's interesting. It's a, it's a good way to get, I would say, like any other test or any other measurement that's trying to assess an individual we're, humans are just so complex that a single measure is not going to do it. I think you really have to look for multiple lenses on the same individual and before you can actually make some generalizations, but it's, it's, a, it's a good one to look at. Another test that was developed was the Byron Emotional Quotient Intelligence Test, which is very, very interesting, which has to do with looking at different aspects of emotional intelligence and wondering um, how people reacted to situational models. According to this model, emotional social intelligence is a cross-section of interrelated emotion and social competencies, skills, facilitators, that determine how effectively we understand and express ourselves, understand others, and relate to them and cope with daily demands. And that, if you look at their paper that's listed down here from 2006, you can actually see a sample in their annex of this model. It basically has 133 different types of items. They're short sentences. People have to respond to them. They also use a Likert scale to, to see at what stage people are at. Because similar to Meyer and Salovey, they don't say that you have emotional intelligence or you don't, or you're high or you're low. They basically have these gradient scales that help you understand where people are stronger or weaker. They don't say, I mean, apparently they all presume that everybody has some level of emotional intelligence, but what they're trying to show is where they're stronger or where they're weaker. So one of the most uh, simple and very intriguing tests, I would say, over the past couple of decades has to do with the marshmallow test. A great new book is out on this. Uh, it came out in 2014. Uh, highly recommended. Basically, this looks at the concept of understanding how you feel, understanding your options, delaying gratification to get a bigger prize. You know, this would be an ultimate end of decision making. Can I decide that I'm going to be able to put off immediate gratification for something that could be a bigger prize at the end of the day? And this has to do with these big ideas of self-control, impulse control, willpower, and all of these things you begin to see how kids depending on their age, between three and four can begin to develop this. But how three-year-olds really are just so bad at this, whereas by the time you hit four, you're pretty good at this. And when they do the follow-up of these individuals over time, they find that these guys are actually better off. Uh, I invite you to read the book so that you can actually get a better sense of this. But right now we'll look at the video. Okay, when they did, when they did this longitudinal follow-up with these people, you can find about a third of these guys, like immediately they'll eat the marshmallow. A third of them try really hard, but they can't do it, right? 
And then there's this really special third of people who can actually put it off, right? And so what did they find out about them? I invite you to do the research and show yourself, okay? Uh, emotions in the brain, some highly recommended resources. Antonio Damasio is actually uh, really one of these leading experts in this area on emotions in the brain if you're interested in, in this angle um, of emotional studies. So then after you've viewed some of the different studies that are out there, I invite you to actually have this big reflection, which, um, which is, is still in debate. You know, what is more important, emotional intelligence or general IQ? You know, being able to be smart. Well, how important is it to be smart in a social context versus in, in academic context? And what does the world really need right now? That's for you guys to debate. Okay, so last two points. Why is emotional intelligence so different from multiple intelligences? When Howard Gardner threw out the uh, inklings of this idea, you know, this is 30 something years ago, right? Um, he did not include emotional intelligences because he had certain uh, parameters, certain networks in your brain that can be stimulated and improved upon. And here's where we differ. Um, emotional intelligence is all over the place in the brain. Well, you might say there's certain networks that are related to decision-making, interpretation of emotions. There's others that are involved in generation of emotions. And so you basically can't nail down where emotions are in the brain. So hopefully um, you guys are really clear about the myth of having, you know, this right emotional brain versus this left logical brain, that is not true. That is just not true. So we have this highly intricate set of neural networks in the brain that are related to emotions, which makes it really hard to, to nail it down and to say, okay, this has evolved, right? So we have difficulty in measuring it. We have difficulty in understanding how it's linked to all these other things. While Gardner, and you can look on his own webpage, he talks about his reaction to emotional intelligence, uh, thinks it's a great addition, nice thing. Um, same thing with, um, you know, moral intelligence. He thinks those things are really nice ideas, but since they don't meet his original criteria, you know, he's stuck to these um, seven ideas with adding on the naturalistic concept as an eighth uh, intelligence back in 2000. So it's not something that he's added to his list of things. Uh, he doesn't say it's wrong. He actually, you know, appreciates emotional intelligence, but it's not part of his um, the theory of multiple intelligences. Is there a difference now, finally, last point, between emotional intelligence and social cognition? Social cognition is your ability unconsciously or consciously to transmit and interpret in the feelings of others. We use this a lot in education because it's very important for teachers to understand how their emotional state can really be contagious and infect the whole classroom, right? So we know that how an individual feels can trigger the change in emotions in the entire group. So this is different. Um, if you had a highly working emotional intelligence system, you would understand that you have to, um, at one level, be able to manage the emotions of others, right? So this would be where social cognition comes into play. So you might say that social cognition is a kind of a sub area of emotional intelligence. Okay, so if we look at it this way, you have uh, in social cognition, you have things that uh, individuals do, and then you have individual factors of those individuals that affect that social environment. And this environment is changed by how people act outwardly, their behavior, and how people feel based on their past experiences. So that, that changes your dynamics. But what's very interesting now is that we have studies coming out of Japan that actually measure how there is a change in neurotransmitters that are evident in, in saliva samples, for example, to show how different uh, social environments created by the teacher influence how the student actually feels. So we understand that this is a big long cycle, you know, that in social cognition you have where an individual is listening to information, they might question information at hand, they'll share something about what's happened, there's some support for the information as far as additional vocabulary, clarification of terms, the teacher might challenge them on what do they really know about these things, there can be this dissonance, there's this moment of, well, I'm not sure, I'm confused, and so you have this uh, cognitive dissonance, then you can give some feedback to the person so they can continue to learn, and they continue to have these types of experiences that change, they transform the individual. But this social cognition cycle um, also is very dynamic. So it can change in any minute. So if, uh, if the conversation starts out good and light and the teacher doesn't have good um, classroom management skills, for example, and one person just goes off in some direction, they can really you know, suffocate a good learning cycle of the others, right? Um, similarly, you can have a, a you know, really bright and perky and wonderful stimulating student who is so empathetic to others 
that uh, he or she might realize, oh, you know, I'm kind of ahead of the curve on this. Maybe I'll help. And they throw their hat in the ring of, with doubts themselves. Uh, whereas they might be pretty clear. They are sensitive enough to how the others are moving along that they want the group to move together. And so they don't show off what they know. They try very hard to bring the whole group along together. So you can have a lot of very interesting dynamics in a classroom, most of which are things that are led by individual teachers. Mainly that's because we have teacher-centered classrooms. But if we had better management styles in our classroom, you'd have a lot more uh, equity as far as the input from all the different individuals in the room. Okay, as we know that the brain judges faces and voices almost unconsciously uh, and immediately um, when we meet people. And so first impressions are lasting, right? So what you first think about an individual can really shape the way you, you choose to interact with them because you think, oh gosh, the first time I met him was so scary. You might back away from uh, further interaction. What you have to realize, though, is that you, know, you should be open because we know that um, these things can change over time. People evolve and people can actually learn to modify their own behavior and you can find them not so scary the next time, right? So long as we can keep our perception of threat lower, then we can be open to new experiences in our contact with other individuals. Finally, stress is both positive and negative. You need stress to stay alert. If you're not alert, you're not paying attention. Uh, but at the other extreme of things, you are too stressed to pay attention. And we know that at both extremes, when you're totally asleep and when you're highly anxious, there's no learning happening, right? So we're looking for this nice fine balance here. It's called eustress, where you're actually alert, but you're not freaked out, okay? And that would be the best level of attention that we look for in a classroom. Obviously, there's several other emotions that come into play. We want to not necessarily be totally happy. Being inquisitive and it can actually be stressful in and of itself and can actually be curious, can be on the scale of emotions. You know, there's intrigue, but you're not happy, you're not sad, you're not aggressive, but you're somewhere else in there in the scale of things, it's this very fine balance and each individual actually has to take the time to reflect. Where is my balance? What am I feeling? And how well can I focus? When a lot of people go into learning situations or contact with others, sometimes they're so obsessed with one particular aspect of their life that they're missing out on all the other things that are happening. And unfortunately, it's easier to obsess over negative emotions than it is over positive emotions. And so hopefully we can find that balance in all of our lives there. Finally, I want to throw in curiosity. Uh, there's a, there is actually a disease, it's called alexithymia, which has to do with the inability to name emotions. It's an individual who can talk, but the one thing they can't do is label their own emotions. I mentioned this to just to go full circle back to part one, when we talked about how do you help children develop emotional intelligence? Well, one of the first things you have to do is help them label those emotions that they're feeling, right? Be able to name it. Um, and one of the biggest problems with these poor individuals is that they are unable to identify with words it means they feel it, right? They have the emotional experience, the consequences of this. If you can't identify your emotions, then you're gonna have emotional types of anxiety. You're not able to make certain types of decisions, and so you're basically stuck, right? One of the studies that was done on this is uh, by Taylor. You can find it in the references. Hopefully, you can, uh, some of you will follow up on this particular theme. Finally, and on a positive note, to help those small kids, again, you know, develop emotional intelligence, we talked about helping kids, you know, identify what do they feel, how are they good, what do they feel good about themselves, you know, when are those good emotions related to specific characteristics of themselves, right, so that they can actually label that, you know, feel good sensation with how, uh, what it is that they are doing, okay? So we're helping them learn to articulate their emotions by giving them words. When they're a bit older, we can try to seek out this level of empathy. So once they've begun to identify this personal level of understanding of their emotions, now we actually challenge them to see those emotions in other people. Okay, with that then, we're going to close, and I invite you again to look into some of these other references and to think about some of the themes that we've talked about and try to study them in a bit more depth in order to satisfy your own personal curiosity about these different areas. And hopefully this information is useful to each of us on an individual scale and in actually bettering the way that we manage the emotions in our lives. Thank you very much. <laughs>